You're listening to Asking for a Friend with therapist Stephen Ng. It's a conversation about human sexuality and how to approach it with intelligence, understanding, and compassion. Hi, this is Stephen Ng, and I'm here with my friend Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi, how are you? I'm well. We're here with uh, Asking for a Friend. So this week, uh, I think somebody wanted us to talk about fairy tale weddings. I can't imagine why. <laughs> uh, let me just start by saying I love Harry. I love Megan. I think that they're <laughs> awesome, and I think that they're going to have a wonderful, loving relationship. That and is, don't we all that hope is my, so? That is my wish for them. Yes, and for every couple that's getting married. Absolutely, absolutely. My problem. <laughs> By the way, I do mean that because I've been in a terrible marriage and a wonderful marriage. And the terrible marriage, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Okay, maybe one or two of them. But I really want people to know what a great marriage is like. So for me, I really do hope that they have a great marriage, great I, relationship. I hope so too. I hope so too. And there's a lot to like about that couple and and. They seem good. They seem like they like each other. I mean, they seem really strong. Um, my problem is with, and it happens every time there's a royal wedding, as you start seeing the newspaper articles and the TV shows and all the things leading up saying about the royal wedding, it's every little girl's dream. The media cliches. Yeah. Yes. It's every little girl's dream. And I just feel like we put way too much pressure on weddings at the expense of the actual relationship. And you're not a mean person. I know you don't mean to crush little people's dreams by bringing this up. <laughs> I, for, for me, I have to tell you, I'm joking because it makes me nervous to talk about this subject in the sense that it, it's sort of like explaining to a very sweet, innocent little child when they ask you, uh, is the tooth fairy real? And you don't want to step on them and say, come on, you idiot. Get your head out of your anatomy and, and figure it out. You really think there's a tooth fairy? Oh, and, and you don't want to also go down in history as the parent who lied to them because then when they get older, they're not going to share their drugs. I, so, <laughs> I, was, so. I was really happy when we got past the days of tooth fairies, tooth fairies and other things, yes. The Easter Bunny, all of the rest of it. So, you know, what we want, I think, is something that's realistic, but without sucking the wonder and the joy and the enchantment out of an experience. And that that's a interesting tightrope to walk. I, I think that weddings are weddings are beautiful and I've seen some, you know, I've I've been to plenty of weddings where I've cried and they I mean, they were wonderful. I think that we put too much pressure and I think that we put honestly too much money and time and effort into these Even um, a million dollar wedding is <laughs> too much money? Well you think about, you know, people and I don't want to even talk about that because it's too judgmental, but I I think my problem is where you start planning your wedding when you're a little girl and you you want this has to be just so and you have to have the flowers just so and this is going to be the music. And the only thing that's missing on that list is the guy. Right. The relationship the, itself. Or the woman, you know, the person who you're going to marry. Right. And, and you're just so caught up in it. And then, you know, you've been to these weddings where they spend a year planning the wedding, every detail of the wedding, and then six months later, they're divorced. Right. It's a little bit like she was playing a little too long, maybe, with Barbie's dream house, and that was where she went to live with Ken after Barbie's wedding and what the marriage industry calls um, her special day. Right. Not his special day right. or their special day, but her special day because uh, – and, and it's all organized around that little girl's dreams to make it all just as beautiful and magical as it can be. Right. And again, I don't I don't want to splash water on, on that little girl's dreams because, I, I mean, everybody gets to be princess. You know, it's nice to be princess for a day. Right. It's really nice. But when they start saying things about the, the royal wedding and how this is every little girl's dream, I mean, last I checked, once Harry's off the market, that's it. Right? I mean, <laughs> We're having a long drought after this. Yeah, we don't we don't get to marry a prince. Wow, well, you don't think there's a cousin or somebody? Well, else probably, out there but not. You don't get this. Oh, you, don't you get probably don't. But in these ones, it's very much like Cinderella, isn't it? With the carriage and the finery and all the pomp and circumstance. And I get it. I mean, I get why people would like all of that. They they want that. I was. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was a hippie back in my youth, so the idea of simplicity really appeals to me, but I get that it doesn't appeal to everyone. Uh, and for those who really want just the perfect experience, 
where nothing whatsoever goes wrong and it's highly choreographed with tons of professional help, including not only camera people, but maybe makeup artists and designers and all the rest of it. Oh, and of course, the wedding planner. Um, you can see it's easy. It's easy to start spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars even for kind of a low end wedding in the United States. So the idea of spending a hundred thousand. I mean, there are a lot of families that that go ahead and do that. And it does seem, from my middle class roots, a little extravagant. But I don't begrudge people who do this anymore, if they can afford it, any more than the people who spend a lot of money on a car. If they can afford it, that's great. Sure. I, I'm not I'm not judging how people spend their money. That's that's up to them. Um, I, I'm more concerned about the expectations. And I guess that's what I wanted to talk about is by putting all this energy and effort into a wedding, what, I mean, what should people be doing while they're planning their weddings to make sure they have a good marriage. <laughs> well, that's kind of how I feel. I, I absolutely love my marriage. I love the idea of marriage. I think it's a fantastic institution. I love the idea of holy matrimony and all the subtlety that comes, you know, with that reference to the sacred. Um, any kind of relationship success or love that works. I'm a typical American in that I I just want everybody to live happily ever after. And that's a part of me that I hope never dies, no matter how old and cynical and how much I resemble that old guy on the lawn yelling at kids to get off his grass. But I but I I think that for me it's it's sort of, you know, the more emphasis that's placed on the wedding, it seems is inverse to the amount of attention that has been put on the actual relationship. And my concern is that there's all this relationship technology that people know nothing of. So I guess feeling overwhelmed a bit, they instead turn to the technical details a little bit like uh, somebody who can't work on a car just really focusing on making sure he gets it washed regularly just so that it looks really good and but never changes the oil or looks at any of the innards uh, t- to make sure it's running properly. That's that's a really good comparison. It's a, that's how it feels to me, especially as a counselor, you know, working with thousands of marriages over my career. I think that there's a lot we could do different to learn some relationship technology. I think there is a, a science to being a good couple, uh, to being a working couple. And I think we could go ahead and learn those things, except uh, nobody seems to know how to do it. So our parents don't teach us that. They certainly don't teach it in school. Uh, they don't even teach it really in church or in the uh, in the military or any of the, our other institutions. So here's this industry that a couple of years ago was, well, in 2016, it was over 70 billion with a B dollars strong. I'm guessing just in America. Just in the United States. And yet nobody really knows how do you do the stuff that we're celebrating? So that's <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> so there, we're not getting, people aren't getting taught this in school. So this is what I'm kind of thinking is a Marriage 101 from Stephen Ng. Ooh. You know, what are some things that people can do to, to have a strong marriage? How... Well, uh, I like what people say when they say love is hard work. It takes a lot of work to make a relationship work because um, at the risk of sounding elitist, that is a lot of nonsense coming from people who don't know what they're talking about. A relationship doesn't take a lot of work. Getting ready to be the kind of adult who could be in a relationship, that could take a minute. That could take some real effort. So uh, what we're talking about mostly is emotional intelligence. And what's involved in that, first of all, is me simply knowing who I am. My knowing my feelings and my needs is the first step to knowing how to have a great relationship. But how many women in this country have noticed he doesn't seem to be able to talk about his feelings. <laughs> and, I've never heard that. Right? So, you know, if you're marrying a guy who's never shared, uh, say, let's say 100 to 1,000 feelings with you over the course of the last three months, I mean, 100 to 1,000 feelings, it's pretty easy to keep track of that. It would be about a feeling a day. And, and if at least 10% of those aren't negative, he's really not capable of sharing his feelings with you. It's a simple measure, but every one of us could notice that. And, and I think if you don't know what your feelings are, it's not that, oh, he cares about feelings because he's a counselor. Of course, that's what counselors do. No, I don't really care about people's feelings. I'm a guy. <laughs> 
I'm a typical guy. What I care about when it comes to feelings is if you don't know what you're feeling, then you can't know what you need. For example, if, I, if I'm lonely, there's, there's no way I can know that I need companionship. And there's no way I could know then that the relationships I'm working with really aren't fulfilling my needs for companionship effectively. If I'm depressed, I need I know that I need some kind of encouragement or lifting up in some way, some change in my lifestyle that's more joy oriented and less oppressive. And until I know that I need that, I'm not going to be able to take the countermeasures to unwind the horrible soul crushing career I have or to maybe get out of some financial deal that I've locked myself into. I need to unwind that perhaps, or perhaps I, I even need to get out of a relationship, maybe with a friend, maybe with a, a lover, uh, perhaps even a fiance. But if you don't, if we, if none of us know our needs, our emotional needs, it makes very little sense to talk about how to have a happy relationship. Uh, it's a little bit like my asking you, how do I get to where you live? And you're saying, well, where do you, where are you coming from? And I'm telling you, I don't know. I have no idea where I'm coming from. What do you mean you don't know where you are? Well, just tell me how to get to your place. Uh, it makes a difference whether I'm supposed to head south or north or east or west. And if I don't know where I am, I don't know how to get to where I want to be. Okay. Does so that make sense? It, it does. It does. But that's that's big. It's huge. It's, it's, it's huge. huge. I said it was hard getting ready. <laughs> it's, being in the relationship is pretty easy, but get, getting ready for the relationship is sort of hard. But they make books. So they make books for this stuff. So say a, a, young, a young engaged couple comes yes. to you. They're getting married in six months. They're, let's say, mid, mid to late 20s. And they say to you, what can we do? To prepare, you know, in the next six months, what can we do to prepare ourselves better to be in a be in a strong marriage? Well, you know, the first question because, because by the way, I really like this idea. And I just came up with it is <laughs> is putting as much energy into preparing for the marriage as you are in planning the wedding. Yeah, actually, I would hope it would be a lot more because it's a lot more important. And a wedding itself should be fairly effortless in the sense, in comparison. In comparison to building a human being, setting up a, a rather elaborate party to celebrate our, our relationship should be fairly easy. Oh, please. You've never planned an event. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. You just tell the right people what you need. Okay. And they take care of that. But if I, you know, if, if I had a couple who came in and they were, especially a couple in the age uh, group you were talking about in their 20s. You know, young people, I think... First marriage. I, I think a lot of younger people are already enjoying some emotional intelligence that people of my own generation uh, and other generations have not. They, they, in many cases, they've learned how to talk about their feelings and what their feelings are. The thing I noticed that they haven't learned is it goes by a lot of different names. Sometimes they call it fair fighting uh, or conflict resolution or... Uh, conflict, resol uh, conflict. Um, gosh, what are some of the other terms? Now I'm spacing out on those, but it doesn't matter because most couples avoid fighting because they think fighting is a bad thing. And I think what they're mistaking typically is abuse is a bad thing. Abuse is a terrible thing, whether it's emotional abuse or physical abuse. And so, of course, we need to not have a abuse, but we all need to embrace conflict because conflict is an essential and inevitable part of every intimate relationship. If we don't know how to have conflicts with each other, we're never going to be able to confront each other about the hurts that are driving us crazy that we would otherwise be behaving in a passive aggressive manner. I know I know she knows she's hurting me. I'll pay her back but this way. Um, or I know that he knows it bugs me when he goes out and gets drunk. I'm just going to give him the cold shoulder for the rest of the day. Well, it's interesting you say that. I was reading an article on Huffington Post, um, eight signs a marriage won't last according to wedding photographers, <laughs> which was really interesting insight. Because, I trust every one of those guys. Well, you know, this. these are the people who are paid to capture your soul. And, your special uh, moments. Your special moments. And um, one of the photographers mentioned when um, the the different, the married, the engaged couple, one would walk out of the room, the other one would say things 
to the photographer, and then they wouldn't say it when the person walked back like in. Like disrespectful things? Kind of disrespectful, star, snarky things, sometimes about money, right? Oh. They they didn't want to talk about money with their person they're going to marry, but they're, they're willing to talk about it with she a photographer. She thinks money grows on trees. He's cheap. I, you know, I don't know what his problem I, is. I really need you to go easy on us on this bill. She's way overspent on it. Oh, but they're not willing to have these conversations with each other. Right, right. And I, but I think, you know, if, if marriage is a strategic alliance for the sake of maximizing our success in this world, part of that alliance has to include our ability to share our thoughts with one another, including the thoughts that aren't so wonderful, you know, that aren't so joyful, like, I love you, baby. Those kind of thoughts are usually well received. The ones that, you know, I'm not really sure I, that we should have gotten married, or sometimes I'm not sure that you love me, or I really don't know how we're ever going to get out of this mess your mother's got us into. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, when people talk about stuff like that, well, they don't mostly. Mostly they don't. They avoid those topics, even though that's what they're thinking, because they have a closed feedback loop in their relationship where if you bring up something that I don't like, I punish you. And by punishing you, either with a cold shoulder or a snarky remark or, well, your mother's not that great either. Um, whatever what she it did is, to you. Yeah, I, what, whatever it is, it's, it's something that discourages future disclosures. And so we want to encourage all that disclosing, right? because we can't fix a problem if we're not aware of a problem. Well, and for sure. And I know personally, if I am bothered by something and I don't say it, it swirls in my head and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And half the time when I say something to the person I'm bothered about, hey, you know, did I do something to upset you? This happened last week. Did I do something to upset you? And, and she said, oh, God, no, I'm so sorry. I'm just really, really stressed out right now. Right. Right. Isn't that nice to check in with each other? And and I totally believe her, but I was building that into something crazy in my head. And then and I think in a in a marriage or a relationship, same thing. If something's bothering you, if you're not willing to talk about it. Well, if I can't talk to her about it, then I need to go out maybe and do something else like to comfort myself because it's a very uncomfortable feeling. And that And by doing something you mean drinking or uh, it was something, anything. I mean, maybe I play another eight hours of video games. Maybe I'm going to go get drunk. Maybe I'm uh, going to be staying a little extra at work, enjoying the company of my new um, secretary. And that is all pleasant stuff. You know, the human brain is wired for pleasure. So this thing about conflict, it's, gosh, it's so hard to express this to people because it sounds so counterintuitive. But resolving conflict s solves the problems that are keeping us apart and actually brings us together. So conflict is this magic carpet that takes us to greater and greater depths of intimacy. And if I don't know how to have a conflict with my mate, and if I can't, oh, I think rise above the law of the jungle. If I can't rise to the level where there's some actual rules like um, the, uh, what are those things in boxing? Uh, boxing according to the rules of oil or something like that. And there's all these parliamentary rules and there's even the Geneva Code for fighting wars. And if, if armies can abide by a Geneva Code or at least have their behavior significantly improved, we too should be able to set up some rules that would help us get ready to have a really great and open feedback loop. Rules like no abuse, arguing by mutual consent, and staying on subject with just one subject. We'll talk some more about this. Uh, this has been Stephen Ng, and you're listening to Ask a Friend, or Asking a Friend. Asking for a Friend. Oh, thanks. I'm going to get this right one of these times. And if you have questions for Stephen, please tweet us at Stephen Ng MFT. Thank you.